<laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello. Welcome, everyone. My name is Sandra Shuri, and I'm the director of state health policy at the California Healthcare Foundation. And I am delighted to see all of you here today. Thank you for coming out on this brisk winter afternoon. The California Healthcare Foundation is an independent philanthropy dedicated to improving healthcare delivery and health outcomes. We're based in Oakland and we support innovations and ideas that improve quality, increase efficiency, and lower the cost of care. Today's convening is one in a series of briefings we sponsor for the Sacramento policy staff and interested others. Uh, the briefings are designed to bring you information relevant to key healthcare policy issues and trends, and are designed to really raise the bar in terms of meaningful policy dialogue here in Sacramento, and then lead to better uh, evidence-based decision-making by our policymakers. Today's event is being uh, broadcast on the web, so you've, you've been notified that you're on camera if you stand up later. Uh, today's event is being co-sponsored. Our co-sponsors are the SCAN Foundation, the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health, the West Wireless Institute, and the California Health Policy Forum. So if you would join me in thanking our co-sponsors for their support and collaboration. Before we get started, I want to introduce to you California Healthcare Foundation's Sacramento team. Uh, we're a newly invigorated, bigger team than we've been previously, and I want to be sure you know who we are. Uh, Michelle Cabrera is our um, program officer and lead government relations staff person. If you don't know Michelle, please come up at the end and introduce yourself to her. And then Danny Sandoval in the back of the room who helped you register has been the program assistant and longtime team member of the CHC. CF Sacramento office. I want to thank Karen Shore for pulling together the logistics on today's event and doing a great job getting you all registered and here and making it all happen. And then I want to really acknowledge Mary Beth Shannon. Mary Beth is CHCF's market and policy monitor team leader. And she and her team were really the inspiration for today's event and did all the heavy lifting on pulling together the panelists and working out the content. And then encouraging um, our data rich colleagues within government and more broadly to come and uh, talk with you at the end of the event. It's now my privilege to invite uh, Dr. Mark Smith to kick off today's event. Dr. Smith's been the president and CEO of the California Healthcare Foundation since its inception back in 1996, and he is well known to the health policy community. But to remind you, Mark's a board certified internist, a member of the clinical faculty at UCSF. He's a cool guy. He does uh, work with an AIDS clinic in San Francisco. He's a member of the Institute of Medicine. So he's plugged in on the clinical and policy side of things. So join me in welcoming Mark. So I'm going to talk for a minute about Harris. Anybody here ever listen to Planet Money? Best podcast there is? So there was a, an interesting Planet Money about two years ago with Todd's co-founder, Jonathan Bush, uh, about the, uh, the work that Athena Health does and the waste in healthcare. There was one more recently about a guy who used to be a Harvard economics professor who's now the CEO of a gaming company. And it turns out that for those of you who do gaming, when you get, they give you that loyalty card that you use to buy your chips or whatever you do, I don't do that, but um, to do whatever you do. I thought that the reason they did that was mainly to build your loyalty to Harris so you didn't go to MGM or someplace else. And it turns out the main reason they do this is so that they can acquire data about you and put that data together with the data they've acquired on thousands of other patrons of their establishment and not only predict your behavior but alter it. And it turns out that if it's your first time at Harrah's um, and you lose 200 bucks right away, you will be an unhappy customer and will not come back. If you win three or 400 bucks and then lose 200 bucks ultimately, even though the economic outcome is the same, you perceive that very differently. You've had a good time 
and so you'll come back. And so when you put your car in the machine, somebody somewhere knows, hmm, first time customer down 150 bucks, someone will slide up to you and say, Dr. Park, are you having a good time? And you'll say, actually, I'm pissed because I've lost 150 bucks. And they will then offer you a comped meal or a drink or a, or a room. And so they know before you do what you will do if you lose 200 bucks. And they've intervened before you've done the thing you were going to do and changed your behavior, which just shows that people who run casinos are smarter than people who do healthcare. <laughs> you get my meaning. The whole notion that through combining real-time access to data, they can not only know what you will do, but statistically at least, but design and execute an intervention that can alter the future uh, is something that the casinos and the retailers now take for granted as part of how they do business. And we're 10, 15 years behind them. But this is the guy who's going to help us catch up. So Todd Park, for those of you who don't know, um, you've seen his resume, you know his title. What, well, I, I think of him in some ways as a Pied Piper for a new attitude towards data in healthcare, particularly among those people who have data, who tend to be big provider organizations and especially government organizations. And he has, in the two and some odd years that he's been at HHS, literally started a revolution in the way in which government sees its role relative to data and its capacity to foster change, not by having the data or even uh, analyzing it and publishing its analysis, by, but by making it available to others to do the work that needs to be done. Uh, Todd, as you know, worked for Booz Allen, um, was one of the co-founders of Athena Health. And so he comes to this government post from a position that's a little different from most people who are senior government leaders. And, that's probably part of what makes him both so inspiring and so innovative in his outlook on these matters. I must say that the foundation's reason, along with our co-sponsors, for being so happy to have him here today and to talk with you about these issues is in part because we've tried to be in the transparency accountability business for some time. We've helped sponsor and run websites that report on hospital quality, on nursing home quality, we're now building a joint registry, but it's apparent to us that we don't have the resources or the smarts to do that work that there are hundreds, maybe thousands of people out there who could also be in the transparency accountability business were the data more widely available, accessible, and easily usable. And so that's the source of our interest and the source of our gratitude to, uh, to Todd for being with us today to talk about the efforts he's leading in this this real revolution in data availability from the federal government. I don't know how an alumnus of Booz Allen would feel about quoting Lenin, but Lenin once said that revolutions are made by men who think as men of action and act as men of thought. And Todd Park is one of those rare individuals who thinks as a man of action and acts as a man of thought. Todd Park. Thank you so much. Hello. Thank you so much for that incredible introduction. Uh, I cannot possibly live up to that. <laughs> but I will try my best to make this a useful afternoon uh, for, for everybody. Uh, I'm Todd Park. I'm the CTO of HHS. Uh, and the first thing you should know about me is that my job title is a giant red herring. I don't actually run all technology at the Department of Health and Human Services. I was uh, hired by Secretary Sebelius and Deputy Secretary Bill Corr uh, to occupy the position called CTO which is really what they describe as an entrepreneur in residence. Uh, so my role is to work with our most talented innovators across HHS, and there are many, uh, to dream up and then execute big new initiatives that help HHS harness the power of data, technology, and innovation to improve the health of the American people. And the initiative that I think we're most excited about in the context of the ones that we've started is one I'm about to talk to you about, which is called the Health Data Initiative. Uh, how many folks here have actually heard about the health data issue? Just so I can baseline the, okay, actually that's, wow, that's <laughs> a lot more than normally. So it's a very savvy audience. So I will, I'll try to actually mix it up so it's both a general overview and, and gets into rich detail in, in key places as well. Um, the other thing I should say is that I'm actually uh, incredibly sleep deprived <laughs> right now. <laughs> uh, 
a combination of it's just being an incredible place to be right now, tons of work happening, and the fact that I have two young uh, children uh, and got on a flight at O'Dark Hunter this morning. So if at any point uh, during my talk I lapse into incoherence, someone please put me on my misery and say, Todd, you're not making any sense, and I will endeavor to be clearer and, and, and more cogent. Okay, uh, so what we're really talking about with health data initiatives is unleashing the power of open data and open innovation to improve health. That's the whole point, to improve health and health through the power of open data and open innovation. And we've just learned extraordinary things about, about uh, how to do this uh, over the last two years through an incredible experience that we, uh, we, uh, we have been fortunate to be part of. Okay, great. Oh, I do. Oh, so this thing doesn't work. It does. Oh, it does. But you need both. I need both mics. Amazing. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so, uh, so the Health Data Initiative is an effort that uh, the Secretary launched about uh, 20 months ago, and its focus is to improve health and health care through the power of open data and open innovation. And the way that we're doing it is by emulating a sister agency in the federal government called NOAA. How many folks here heard of NOAA? Fantastic. So NOAA, uh, for those of you who don't know what NOAA is, is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. It uh, collects virtually all weather data, most of the weather data collected in the United States, and for decades now has not just collected this data, but has published it in machine-readable form, meaning that you can actually import it into other applications and services for free for anyone to pick up without intellectual property constraint. This has then fed a huge host of innovations that NOAA hasn't had to pay for, NOAA hasn't had to manage, NOAA hasn't had to invent, like weather newscasts, weather websites, mobile weather apps, weather insurance, et cetera. Uh, in fact, actually, there's a recent conversation uh, that became famous uh, in D.C. between two congresspeople during hurricane season, and one congressperson said to the other congressperson, you know, budgets are tight. I think we should actually cut the budget of NOAA significantly because I don't understand the value of NOAA when I have the weather channel. <laughs> and the other congressperson said, no, no, no. <laughs> like all the weather data channel, all the weather data and weather channel actually comes from NOAA. And the congressman said, oh, I didn't know that. Um, but just a great example of how public data made open can feed lots of innovations like the weather channel and produce a huge amount of good for the American people in a way that NOAA by itself couldn't do, in a way that the weather channel by itself couldn't do. Uh, the government ran a similar open data play in the 80s uh, when uh, President Reagan liberated GPS data, global positioning system data, which is a government data set, uh, which I think probably everyone knew, knew but, but just in case you didn't, it's from the U.S. government. And uh, GPS data, of course, now feeds everything from uh, your iPhone, uh, Foursquare on your iPhone, uh, to super tanker navigation systems, uh, the GPS in your car, everything in between. Another great example of the government opening up a data set as a public good and then innovators across the country turning it into massive value uh, for the American people. So the Health Data Initiative is uh, our third effort as a U.S. government to run this play, open up the data and let innovators of the world turn into massive goodness. Uh, this time it's to improve health and health care. And what we're doing is we're actually uh, liberating billions upon billions of dollars of data from the vaults of HHS, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, NIH, FDA, CDC, Administration on Aging, data we already paid for as a country, but now we're jujitsuing it by putting it out uh, into the public domain in ways that are easy for developers and innovators to use to turn into products and services, uh, the equivalent of newscasts, uh, weather websites, mobile apps, et cetera, but now in the health domain, in the health universe, to help improve health and healthcare by getting more and more of the right information in the hands of consumers and patients, doctors and hospitals, journalists, communities and states, uh, uh, policymakers of all stripes, employers, et cetera. The uh, objective, at the end of the day, is to, in fact, catalyze the emergence of an ecosystem of innovation, a whole universe of innovators that are taking our open data and producing products and services that help consumers uh, take control of their health and health care, help con uh, employers promote health and wellness, help providers deliver better care, journalists write better stories, policymakers make better decisions. The whole idea is not just to publish data, right, but to help catalyze the emergence of a whole universe of innovative products and services that help people in very concrete ways, uh, improve health and health care, and create jobs of the future at the same time. The play is actually incredibly simple and incredibly cheap, uh, which is you know, a wonderful, wonderful thing uh, in these constrained times. Uh, what we basically have done, and really any government can do this, it's not unique to HHS, if we can do it, you can definitely do it, uh, is one, we're publishing brand new data for public access. This is data we already have. It's already sort of in our vaults. We've already spent money on it. We're just publishing it for public access while rigorously protecting privacy. We'll talk a lot more about that. That's a cardinal rule, very important to, to follow. Secondly, uh, maybe even more interestingly, 
uh, we're taking existing data that's already public, but it's actually in forms that are pretty inaccessible. Uh, it's in PDFs, it's in books, it's on static web pages, right? Uh, all of which is useless to developers. And we're turning it into what's called machine-readable data. Now, machine-readable sounds like a scary term, but it's really not. It's basically just any data that can be imported into another IT application, another uh, software application, uh, and used as fuel by that software to do wonderful things. An Excel spreadsheet is computable data. Uh, XML, common delimited, you know, yada, yada. This is all computable data. Now, the coolest way to make data available uh, is through what's called an application programming interface, an API, which is just a fancy word for a port that you put on a data set to allow people to you know, auto extract that data and, and have it actually uh, auto import it into another application. But frankly, a lot of the data we're making available is Excel spreadsheets. Not hard. Uh, because the data actually is inherently machine readable because it's sitting in a machine. <laughs> if it's on a website, it's sitting in a machine. So you can actually publish it in an Excel spreadsheet, even in an API, you know, for like four, four cents. It's like really easy. Um, and then finally, in addition to actually publishing brand new data and existing data in machine readable form, think Excel spreadsheets or APIs, we are energetically marketing the heck out of our data to innovators of the world. Because uh, what we've discovered is that approximately 98% of the innovators that could build useful things for consumers, doctors, communities, et cetera, with our data, don't even know we have this data, let alone the fact that we're making it available to the public. Um, so we are having to market the heck out of our data, because if you chop down a bunch of data trees in the data forest to expect people to build houses with it when they don't know it's there, they're not going to build houses. They're only going to build the houses with it if you let them know that there are logs for them to use. So we're publicizing the fact that we're, we're, uh, we're making this stuff available. Uh, and encouraging innovators to turn it into apps and services that can help improve health and healthcare. So you might say, well, what kinds of data are we liberating? Uh, and uh, it, it's uh, impossible to talk about all of it because there's so much of it. I, like literally daily, I learn about new data sets that we have I didn't know we had. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, but let me talk about uh, some categories and some examples within the categories to show you the kinds of data that HHS has accumulated over the years and that we're now making available. So one is community health data. Uh, we made uh, over uh, 1,100 metrics of national, state, hospital, referral region, and county level, at whatever level of granularity they're available. Uh, metrics available of public health performance, like smoking rates, obesity rates, uh, uh, healthcare system performance, like uh, avoidable uh, hospital readmissions by condition, uh, utilization of healthcare services by type, uh, you know, again, by community. Uh, determinants of health performance, like access to healthy food by community, and made it all available on a website called healthindicators.gov, uh, where it's not only viewable on the website, but also downloadable and extractable via one of these APIs. So that's very, very cool. It shows you incredible things in terms of the variation uh, in health, healthcare, and in terms of health performance across the country, which really sparks a lot of thinking uh, about what the right course of action might be to improve health in your community. Um, secondly, we're taking directories of providers of health and human services and making them machine readable and downloadable. Uh, so a great example of this is that uh, we have this agency called the Administration on Aging, uh, which has always been kind of the redheaded stepchild of CMS. It gets none of the glory, none of the money, right? But it does this amazing thing, which it, it, it funds human services and communities for seniors. It funds meals on wheels and transportation services and counseling services to help the elderly age well at home. And AOA has always been so frustrated because they say, look, you should fund us, you should use our services, because if we do our job right, then you don't have to use as much of the hospital system, as much of the nursing home system, because the elderly are staying healthy and well at home. <laughs> so they've had a big, re big breakthrough recently using the power of open data. They had this elder care locator, which was this website that they had elegantly crafted where you could type in your zip code and find services for seniors, which nobody knew about and nobody used, right? But they had this idea. They said, what if we made all of those services downloadable in an Excel spreadsheet. So they did, and we actually promoted that uh, to a bunch of innovators. And so electronic health record companies, companies that build case management systems for nurses, uh, other systems that are used by healthcare providers are now incorporating that data so that if you're a nurse discharging someone from a hospital, right, a senior, it automatically tees up to you that in that area, there are transportation services, meals on wheels services that could actually help this diabetic senior uh, who you're about to show from the hospital, uh, get the right kind of food. Transportation services are available to help get the elderly person to their primary care appointment that they might miss otherwise. And if they miss that appointment, if they don't see their doc, if they don't get the right food, they might end up right back in the hospital. Um, so it's a way of bridging the historic divide between the human services system and the healthcare system, which all of us know have been unconscionably separate from each other, bridging that divide through the power of data. 
by having the availability of human services infect the systems that are running the healthcare system. So super awesome. And it, and it costs AOA nothing. But it's increasing the social return on our investment in, in AOA services. Um, we have these phenomenal databases of uh, hospital quality, nursing home quality, home health quality, which like nobody knows about. <laughs> we have a website that very few people use. Um, and in fact, I think a recent survey showed that 94% of Americans didn't realize that HHS had detailed quality information about hospitals. I was shocked there wasn't 99%. <laughs> so what we've done recently is we put APIs um, on our compare data. And what that basically means is that we've made it a lot easier for other people who run websites and applications and services to grab our quality data and integrate it into what they do. So there's this uh, famous Californian named Tim O'Reilly. Uh, who here knows Tim O'Reilly? He is a god in the tech universe. He's like Obi-Wan Kenobi. He's this amazing dude. He even looks a little bit like Obi-Wan Kenobi. And he has this fundamental law of how data helps people. I call it O'Reilly's law. He would never call it that, but I call it O'Reilly's law. O'Reilly's law states that if you want data to help people, don't make them find it. Make data find people where people can use help, right? So Bing did this brilliant thing. Um, Bing is a search engine, of course, which is used by a lot of people. So they've integrated, they've ingested our hospital compare data so that when you type in the name of a hospital in Bing, you have to meet certain criteria for this to happen. Uh, but uh, for a bunch of hospitals, if you type in, say, New York Presbyterian Hospital, it will put up in the primary search result above the ads, above all the other results, the, the patient satisfaction rating as measured by CMS with New York Presbyterian versus the state average with a link to more information. So even if you had no idea that there was patient satisfaction information available about hospitals, now you know, right? When you were searching for information about a given, a given hospital, it got pushed to you at the moment where it was genuinely useful. They probably got 20x the use of our data <laughs> in that one fell swoop. And they're just one of many examples. Uh, and, and just to show how useful this is, uh, you know, my wife recently delivered our second baby. Uh, we had narrowed it down to a few hospitals. I used Bing. Uh, to search uh, for the best hospital, I found that one hospital had a much higher patient satisfaction rating than the others, and that's where we went. Uh, so we're eating our dog food, as it were, and it's genuinely tasty. It's genuinely useful. Um, so uh, uh, another example, actually, uh, and this is one I find especially exciting, although it's unbelievably geeky. Um, how many folks here heard of Section 10332 of the Affordable Care Act? Woohoo! All right, rock on. Excellent. So for those of you who haven't heard about this, Section 10332 of the Health Reform Law is a revolutionary provision that just went live. The final regulation implementing it just got published two days ago. And uh, it allows Medicare for the first time to provide provider-identified, physician-hospital-identified claims data to qualified entities outside the government, public and private entities, who can mash up that data with other payer data to produce detailed quality reports with respect to physicians, physician groups, hospitals, et cetera. Uh, it's very, very exciting. Um, there's a rigorous process where you actually produce the metrics, then you have to show the metrics to the doctor before it gets published so they can vet it and appeal it and make sure it's cool. And then it gets published for the public for free. Very, very, very exciting. Uh, the data will start to flow in the first quarter of 2012. We'll start to see our first metrics uh, toward the end of 2012. But you know, for all of us who have had a health episode in our lives and have found the right provider, uh, at the physician level by asking our mother's cousin-in-law who went to medical school 18 years ago, who should I use, right? There's about to be much, much, much better data. And if you're a doc who's wondering how you stack up against your peers, there's about to be much, much, much better data, and that will have all kinds of wonderful, wonderful effects. Um, so that's very, very exciting. How many folks here have heard about Blue Button? Okay, cool, excellent. Um, well, you guys, I mean, <laughs> you guys know everything. <laughs> so. Blue Button is this really neat venture that the Veterans Administration has led, and we're very proud to have been a part of it, um, where last October, we did a very simple thing. Uh, the VA, the Department of Defense, and Medicare uh, allowed, for the first time, veterans, uh, members of the military, and Medicare beneficiaries to go to a secure website, authenticate themselves, and hit a blue button that allows them to download a copy, electronic copy, of their own information. So Medicare, your own claims data, uh, if you're a vet or a member of the military, your own personal health record data. Uh, and we actually weren't sure how many people would care. Uh, we just thought it would be a really, really good thing to do because on principle, it's not our data, it's your data. You should be able to get a copy of your own data. Uh, in fact, actually, Secretary Shinseki at the VA was told by his Blue Button team that if it was a smashing success that 25,000 veterans, 1,000 veterans would download a copy of their own data. And with basically no marketing, because most people don't 
still know about this, uh, half a million Americans in the last year have downloaded a copy of their own data, uh, on average two to three times each. And it's, it's snowballing. Actually, I learned after we launched Blue Button, the number one Freedom of Information Act request that CMS gets by far every year is Medicare beneficiaries asking through FOIA to get a copy of their own data. So now we're telling them, you, you can get a copy of your own data. <laughs> Just go to mymedicare.gov, authenticate yourself, get an account, and download your own data. It's very, very exciting. Um, e even more interesting than that, um, and some of you may have heard this uh, before, but um, when we launched Blue Button, word started to spread in certain circles, private sector circles, and folks in the private sector started to call us. States started to call us, um, saying, are you allowed to do that? We said, can you clarify the question? You know, and these folks said, are you allowed under HIPAA to give people a copy of their own data electronically? <laughs> we said yes, and boy, we have done a really crappy job communicating HIPAA. Uh, but you know, quite honestly, you know, I mean, you know, any memo or guidance document we could have issued would not have been nearly as effective as the U.S. federal government just doing it itself uh, uh, for Medicare folks and for uh, veterans, et cetera. Um, so now there's now a site that was launched by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation recently called bluebuttondata.org, where everyone can learn that it is, in fact, it is in fact legal to give people a copy of their own data electronically. Uh, you can learn how to do it. It's incredibly simple. It's like four lines of code. Um, and uh, you can learn about the policies under which you should be doing it. Uh, and you can commit publicly to do it. Uh, and so there's a growing tide of people besides us who have done Blue Button. So Aetna has Blue Buttoned its personal health record, uh, which is the largest commercial personal health record in the country. 10 million people use it. Uh, United Health, not to be outdone by Aetna, has decided to Blue Button its data for 7 million Americans. Uh, McKesson, uh, which operates a personal health record uh, that's used by 200,000 doctors, has Blue Buttoned that personal health record. The state of Indiana is Blue Buttoning its data. The state of Louisiana is going to be Blue Buttoning immunization registry data and Medicaid data. Uh, the state of Vermont is going to be blue buttoning data, and so it's, it's a growing tide of blue buttoning. And the bottom line is that people are going to be able to get a copy of their own data and then feed that into services and apps that can help us take control of our own health care, the health care of our families, uh, which, is, which is very, very exciting. Um, and then there's actually another step beyond that, uh, which may be even more obscure than Section 10332. <laughs> but how many, here, how many folks here are, are, are familiar with the, uh, the final accountable care organization rule, ACO rule? Does this ring a bell? Okay, so basically ACOs, accountable care organizations, right, are these new care delivery uh, organizations um, that, that can form and uh, basically get certified by Medicare. And they can enter into arrangements with Medicare where they're essentially paid to keep people healthy, which is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, and what's happening is that to help them keep people healthy through proactive monitoring, uh, through population health management, care coordination, stitch and timing, care gap closing that saves the ER visit, saves the hospitalization, saves the complication, right? To help them do that, CMS, for the first time, is going to provide ACO doctors, if the beneficiary says it's cool, with information about the claims history of their patients so they can actually run that through their engines, identify care gaps, and make sure that screenings happen, follow-ups happen, et cetera, uh, that can ensure that that patient stays as healthy as humanly possible. Uh, so very, very, very exciting stuff. Um, we obviously have a bunch of information about consumer products, uh, FDA recall data. We made available in lots of forms, but we actually finally made it available in XML format. XML is another thing that if you say to one of your resident geeks XML, they'll go crazy with happiness, right? XML just makes it really easy to, again, ingest this information into other software applications so they can actually parse it and mash up other data and use it for good. Um, healthcare.gov is a site that we uh, launched uh, last uh, July. It's the first site that has a comprehensive inventory of every public and private health insurance option across the United States by zip code uh, for the individual and family market, for the small business market. Uh, we made the uh, entire directory of all those insurance products downloadable uh, via a mass file uh, just a, a few months ago. Um, the National Institutes of Health have been doing open data since long before it was cool to do so. And this is actually important to talk about because you know, not all data that's important is numerical. A whole bunch of the data that we're making available is, in fact, not numerical, uh, but it's still able to be structured in a way that can be beamed into other applications to help people. Um, so a great example of this is clinicaltrials.gov. How many folks here have heard of clinicaltrials.gov? Okay, great. This is a great audience. I love this. Um, so for those of you who don't know what it is, it's an inventory uh, on a website of basically every clinical trial happening in America and in many countries around the world. There are 115,000 clinical trials in clinicaltrials.gov right now. 
Um, and uh, it, I'll talk a little bit more about how people are beginning to use it. But that's actually something that we've deployed an API to, uh, which makes it easy, again, to extract that data and mash it up with other data. For example, like in integrating into electronic health records so doctors can search for clinical trials that are helpful uh, for patients they're seeing and point them in the right direction. Um, have you heard of Medline Plus Connect? Okay, so Medline Plus is a website we've run for a long time that is an encyclopedic compendium of patient education uh, material. Essentially, it's got uh, on a bunch of web pages detailed patient education information on like every disease, medication, so on and so forth, uh, known to humankind. So what we did with Medline Plus Connect last November is we built a service where we broke down, the National Library of Medicine did, all of that content into specific subchunks that map to individual diagnoses, individual drugs, individual lab tests. And then we set up a service where for free, any electronic health record or personal health record can say, I've got a patient with these drugs and with this diagnosis. Send a query to Medline Plus Connect. Medline Plus Connect thinks for a little bit and then spits back a customized patient education package electronically that fits that specific situation and allows the electronic health record or personal health record to ingest that into their workflow and at the point of care, exactly when the doc needs it, exactly when the patient needs it, surface the information they need, the latest and greatest medical information from NIH, real time in the doc's office or in front of the patient. So it's like having the National Library of Medicine plugged into your office for free, continually updated all the time, and digested, pre-digested for you. Uh, so very, very exciting stuff. Uh, government spending, we're making a lot of data about government spending available. You know, I won't belabor all the details, but uh, you know, long story short, you know, there's just a lot of data we're making available. Uh, a lot of data we're making available, um, and it's just a small subset. And to make it easy for people to find it, because it's actually very hard for people to find this stuff, we published a site called healthdata.gov uh, in February. It's the one-stop shop to get all of our free data. Uh, and we keep adding more and more and more to it all the time. Now, I should say that actually what's on healthdata.gov is what we call fully open data. So it's the data like hospital quality data or FDA recall data or community health data uh, that you can actually let anybody have without data use agreement. Um, there's another category, a layer of data I've referenced that one might call controlled access data, where for privacy reasons, you cannot make it freely available to everybody, right? So blue button is a great example, right? It would be bad if everyone in this room could go get Mrs. Jones' Medicare claims, right? But what we do is we allow Mrs. Jones to authenticate herself and then get her own Medicare claim. So that's an example of controlled access data. So very important to keep those straight. But it's pretty easy to keep them straight because, you know, basically personal data should be private. Um, and data like hospital quality or FDA recalls isn't personal, so you can actually make that available to everybody. Um, and then on top of this, uh, we have been publicizing, publicizing our data to innovators across the country uh, in a campaign that has been unconventional for us, but that we're really grooving to. Uh, it's producing really, really spectacular results. So we've been doing uh, challenges and codathons. Have you heard about this? There's a site called health2challenge.org, uh, another site called challenge.gov, uh, on which, uh, in the former case, uh, government agencies, uh, foundations, companies, in the latter case, government agencies, are publishing, uh, issuing public challenges, uh, launching competitions to build the best app or product that helps communities understand cancer trends and take action, or build the best application that helps consumers understand their healthcare provider choices and pick the ones right for their family, et cetera. Um, they have a period of, uh, of a competition where you can build your thing or modify your thing and enter it, then a panel of judges. Uh, judges uh, all the uh, entries, um, and uh, then you win, you know, lunch with someone famous or, you know, a cash prize or whatever, and people aren't actually doing it for the lunch or the cash prize. They're doing it to contribute something uh, in a really, really fun, cool way, and also potentially lay the groundwork for doing something really amazing with it in terms of building a business or adding to a product line or whatnot, uh, but turning into something that's really, really real. Uh, but uh, these have been really phenomenally, uh, phenomenally successful. Um, Codathons are challenges, but done in the context of a single day. So like 150 people sort of get together, health experts and patients and doctors and developers, you know, for eight hours at, say, Georgetown University and, you know, scrub it into health data and actually brainstorm stuff and then build stuff and see who can build the best stuff. Um, and uh, one of my favorite uh, stories about this is uh, uh, about this particular group of folks here. Um, these are five young people from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And they heard somehow about the Georgetown Health Data Codathon, uh, which is being run by Health 2.0, which is a partner of ours that has been really doing all this challenge and codathon work for us. Uh, and uh, they got very excited. Uh, even though it was very far away, they were determined to compete in this thing. So they uh, bought these lab coats with matching insignia. Uh, they rented a van. They got up at Odark 100 on a Saturday in February and drove for hours uh, in the pre-dawn darkness to get to Georgetown in time for the 9.30 kickoff 
of this codify. And they had no background in health and healthcare, but they scrubbed into our data and they talked to experts and they learned about this phenomenon called food deserts. So who here actually knows about uh, food deserts? Okay, so this was new to this crew. Um, and uh, so food deserts, of course, are swaths of America, and there are all too many of them, where if you live in this area, you cannot get access to affordable, healthy food, which is a huge problem from lots of perspectives. Um, and because they were new to this, they didn't know that it's impossible to solve this problem. <laughs> they hadn't gotten the memo about what's impossible, so they decided to solve it in eight hours. And what they did was they built an app that won the Codathon called Food Oasis. Have you heard about Food Oasis? So Food Oasis is this brilliant mashup of text messaging and farmer's markets. Think of it as text messaging meets virtual farmer's markets. Uh, if you have access to text messaging, which virtually every American does now, including in uh, 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 underserved areas, uh, you can use Food Oasis. What you do is you, you, you text in uh, the fact that you want to buy a zucchini and five tomatoes. And all your neighbors can do the same. It all goes to a central website and then a, uh, a set of uh, anyone who wants to, food suppliers, farmers markets, co-ops, can go to the website, circle the orders they want to fulfill, and hit fulfill. Then it texts everyone back and says, OK, show up at St. John's Church at 3 PM on a Saturday. Uh, and between 3 to 5 PM, you can get your food. Uh, now, I don't know anything about the food business, but I've been educated to understand that if you don't need physical infrastructure in the neighborhood, if you know demand entirely in advance, and if the second you show up, within two hours, all of your food gets bought, and then you go home, the cost of food tends to drop. Who knew? Um, and so this is a really, really neat idea. And beyond just being something that won the Codathon, they're actually, they've refined it significantly. They're wise enough to know that rarely does your first idea uh, you know, equal the one that's optimal, right? So they've got this whole process to test it and refine it. They're about to close an investment from a big company uh, to turn this into a real thing, like a real company. That seven American cities are lined up to test it. And more cities want to try it after that, which is amazing, right? You know, and I don't know if that specific idea is going to work or not, although it sounds very promising. But the thing I'm really, really excited about is that these five young people are now addicted to the idea of leveraging the power of data and IT to improve health. The only thing I learned as an entrepreneur in the private sector is the following rule. If you get the best people, you win. If you don't, it becomes substantially harder. <laughs> The same thing is true of ecosystems. If we can attract more and more and more of the best innovators in America into health and healthcare, we will win as a country. We will invent our way out of our health problems. There's no problem America has that we can't invent our way out of if we try. And the fact that these code of challenges are bringing these people into, people like the, the, the Food Oasis team, into our ecosystem is the most exciting thing about them. I actually could care less about the apps they're building. <laughs> I care more about the people that they're recruiting to team up with us to innovate our way out of our healthcare issues. We've been doing lots and lots and lots of meetups and conferences across the country to spread the word about the data and how to use it. Uh, and we've been doing annual health data palooses. Have you, um, have you have any, how many folks here have been to one of our health data palooses? Okay. Um, so uh, for the rest of you, I, I can't recreate it <laughs> as a one-man show, although I'd like to try. Um, but let me just describe to you what a health data palooza is. Uh, they're hosted by the secretary, who loves all of this. Uh, and Institute of Medicine. And what we do, and we just did our second one, June 9th, 2011, is we issue an open call for the best products and services that people have built using our data that concretely help consumers and patients, doctors and hospitals, employers, communities, states, et cetera. Um, they also, to make it into the data palooza, have to have a sustainable business model. We're not interested in concept cars that no one could actually drive if they wanted to. We're only interested in stuff that's deliverable to real people today in a scalable way. Even with a relatively limited open call, and even with those very tough criteria, we were overwhelmed by the number of people who wanted to present and who actually met the criteria. So we ended up doing a virtual American Idol style bake-off over WebEx to select the 50 that we could somehow cram into our conference center uh, if we tried. And uh, people started calling me Paula Abdul because I was weeping constantly. And just, I loved everybody. They were all amazing. I couldn't believe we were going to cut this person. Uh, but the judges were, frankly, you know, much more discriminating than me, who was just an observer. And they narrowed it down to 50, uh, which we, who then actually presented their innovations uh, on June 9th. Um, you can check out all 50 of the presentations uh, at the Institute of Medicine's website. And what I would say to you is that if your faith in America if your faith in our ability to innovate in healthcare is wavering even in the slightest at this moment, 
go watch as many of these videos as you can. Because it's the most inspiring injection of faith and mojo I could possibly imagine. It's the most awe-inspiring display of American innovation mojo I've ever seen. And again, I can't possibly do justice to it, uh, but let me just describe uh, some examples of what people did, just to show you uh, what, uh, what, what I'm talking about. Um, so one category of examples is uh, new services and applications that help consumers take control of their own health and health care. So iTriage, have you heard of iTriage? It's this great little company out of Denver, Colorado, that got started just like two years ago, and they've ingested large amounts of government and other data to provide this really powerful uh, uh, mobile and web app that helps you understand what might be going wrong with you in terms of symptoms, and then critically find the best local provider and then book an appointment with that provider. Um, early on uh, in the history of their development, they ingested the newly downloadable directory of all the FQHCs, federally qualified health centers, community clinics, at which free and low cost care is offered. Uh, and they imported it into their provider search tool. And within three months, something like 50,000 Americans had found free and low cost care at FQHCs through this tool. They've uh, also integrated the directory of all of our mental health and substance abuse treatment centers uh, to make access to mental health services much more, uh, 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 much more findable uh, and, uh, and to increase levels of access uh, and people getting help. Um, they just passed three million users. Uh, they're hiring 65 people in Denver this year. and They just got bought by Aetna, which wants to scale them massively across the country. And uh, the head of our uh, SAMHSA organization, the Substance Abuse and uh, Mental Health Services Administration, is tickled pink. Because basically all she had to do was make the data that was in her website about where all the mental health services were, downloadable in an Excel spreadsheet, and it infected this incredibly cool company's app. So she just acquired, essentially without having to acquire it, without spending any money, a 3.1 million user virally expanding app that helps people find mental health help at no cost to her. She looks like a rock star. She is a rock star. It's awesome. Um, Healthline's another example. Um, so they're another young company uh, that touches about actually 100 million people a month now because they power health search on Yahoo and Dr. Oz's website, Etna's website, et cetera. And uh, uh, if you've ever used the internet for health search, what, 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 what you quickly find out is that it's actually kind of a hit and miss proposition, right? I mean, you get both stuff that's actively helpful and stuff that's actively dangerous if you use conventional internet health search. So what they've done is they've met a market need by ingesting huge amounts of data from the government NIH, CMS, ARC, et cetera, to make health search on the internet a hell of a lot more reliable and targeted. Uh, and we're tickled pink about it because, you know, I mean, we can't possibly build a search engine that touches 100 million people a month and run and keep up to date, but we have one now because <laughs> our data is infected Healthline and it is using it to provide lots of, uh, lots of good stuff to consumers across the country. Um, there are services like vitals.com that are essentially shopping services for healthcare providers. Uh, using government and other data to help you know before you go what your choices might be and which ones to go to, which will get ever more powerful as things like Section 10332 uh, go live. Uh, patients Like Me is another great example. Um, I, I, I'm sorry I'm talking through all of them. I just, I just love all these examples. I just love all these people. They're just doing incredible stuff. I can't help myself. It's like talking about my family. Um, but Patients Like Me is another uh, great example. They're a site launched by a guy named Jamie Haywood in Massachusetts. And they have, I think, 130,000 people now. Uh, that have serious illnesses that use patients like me to voluntarily share their detailed personal health records with each other to help each other get well. ALS is their largest community. They won best in show uh, at the Health Data Palooza by rolling out a new feature called Trials for Me, where they actually integrated with the clinicaltrials.gov repository. So if you want, any patients like me patient can now see for whatever their self-defined geographic area is, all the clinical trials that might relate to their detailed profile, they're happening in their area. And if a new trial materializes, you get instantly notified about that new trial, a new trial that could save your life or help you improve the lives of others in dramatic ways. Um, Asmopolis, I'm just talking about Asmopolis, I'm sorry, but as, have you heard of Asmopolis? Okay, so Asmopolis um, is this crazy awesome example uh, where a single person, David Van Sickle, um, uh, decided that it would be a good idea to basically take a, uh, a GPS device uh, and attach it to a uh, asthma inhaler and link it to a web app. So that every time you use the inhaler, it would record when and where your attack happened, and you could share that data uh, with yourself and with your doc. If you've ever cared for an asthmatic, right? Who here has actually cared for an asthmatic? So if you ask them to replicate for you on a map with a time series where and when all their, attack ha all their attacks happened in the last week, the last month, the last 24 hours, do you think they could actually do that for you? Not so much. But that's really important information, right? Because asthma is an environmentally sensitive condition. 
So what happened was Asmopoulos was tested by a group of about 80-something asthmatics. The average rate of uncontrolled asthma among these asthmatics was about 75%, which is the American average. Um, and uh, uncontrolled asthma is defined as you use your inhaler more than two days a week. Um, after several months of using Asmopoulos, uh, the rate of uncontrolled asthma among this population dropped by half. Uh, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a scientific test, but it was actually a very interesting directional test. And the reason it dropped was, as you and your doctor looked at the data, very interesting things materialized, like the fact that all your attacks were happening at work, or uh, what were happening when you walked past the factory every morning, right? Or uh, one woman actually, in all seriousness, discovered that whenever she vacuumed her cat, she had an asthma attack. And you know, she might have you know, known to realize that earlier, but, but data helps people in mysterious ways, right? So it's now rolling out in a broader test uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, and in North Carolina. It's raised angel funding from distinguished angel investors like Mitch Caper, uh, founder of Lowe's123. Um, and uh, it's, 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 a, it's a really hot, cool thing, leveraging the power of data. Um, I know we're running out of time, so I won't, I won't talk through all these examples. But another category is a set of new apps and services that actually uh, uh, do the Harris thing, if you will, uh, but in healthcare, basically help doctors and hospitals better help their patients stay healthy. Uh, and so a lot of these are, are bucketed in uh, a category that you might call accountable care enablement services. Someone's got to come up with a better name than that, but that's the name I've been hearing. And essentially uh, what they do uh, is they walk up to a doctor group or a health system and say, look, I'll provide you with all the data, the analytics, the call centers, the nurses, the back office operations to turn you into a virtual Kaiser for no upfront cost and as a service partner. Um, and uh, one great example of this is Aetna, which has decided that this is its business of the future, is to do this. Uh, and they rolled out at the Health Data Palooza, I think one of the most amazing innovations, which was a nurse, a nurse. <laughs> and you, you might call it sort of nurse 2.0. They have 3,000 case management nurses and call centers across the country. And what they did was, as opposed to build some, you know, building some super sexy iPad app, they built an IT cockpit for those nurses that accessed huge amounts of government and other data to help that nurse become even more all-powerful and omniscient than he or she already was. And uh, the example that they showed was, okay, let's say I'm an Aetna call center nurse. I'm sitting in New Albany, Ohio, in the big call center that Aetna has there. I've just been assigned by a medical home in Georgia to help care for a patient who's 60 years old, diabetic, depressed, about to go to renal failure, and about to be discharged from the hospital. And it showed how the nurse then pulled up all this data saying, okay, you live in a food desert, that's the bad news, but the good news is that there's Meals on Wheels in your area, I will set it up for you. Here's the closest and best dialysis center. Here's the closest and best mental health center. I'm gonna actually arrange for transportation services for you. Here's the latest and greatest counseling in terms of nutritional and medical information that you need that I will describe to you. And the coolest part for me is that this 60-year-old didn't have to be manipulating icons on an iPad to get help. She was getting help, data-powered help, through one of the most effective user interfaces ever designed, talking to another human being. <laughs> so when we think about applying the data, yeah, I love iPad apps, I love iPhone apps, I got an iPhone, right? Yeah, and that's cool, but that's a very limiting construct, right? Think instead about the application of data writ large, any use of the data at any level to help make healthcare better, right? Whether it's giving consumers info they need to make better decisions about what provider to see, helping doctors and nurses sitting in call centers and medical offices get critical information to help them take better care of people, helping policymakers better see the landscape, get situational awareness about what the heck's going on, see food deserts, see play deserts, and take targeted actions to close them, to waste them, right? So think about data expansively. Think about its use expansively as any use that helps inform better decisions to improve health and health care at all levels of the system. And as a final category, uh, helping communities improve health, Incredible stuff happening here, incredible stuff happening here. Um, have you heard of Ozioma? So Ozioma is this amazing service that was built by a team at the U Washington St. Louis, University of Washington St. Louis, and essentially it's a virtual health research department, starting with cancer and it's adding other topics as well. But if you're a blogger or a journalist or an analyst uh, and you want to say learn more about cancer disparities and community X, Y, and Z, then you can actually just hit that button, essentially, or demarcate that in the Ozioma tool, and it will start crunching all the data for you and writing your story for you. In very elegant English, I might add. It's a very, very good writer. Um, and you know, in a world where journalists, bloggers, and analysts continue to be the most effective channels to raise awareness, I think, about community health issues and mobilize action, right? Uh, but in a world where they can increasingly not afford their own private health researcher, having a tool like Ozioma as an incredibly low-cost private health researcher that works for you as a blogger or a researcher using public data uh, is a very powerful tool to help there be more stories and more insights that help spur more action. And there are other examples 
uh, along these lines as well. Uh, and I can't go into all of them because we don't have time, but, but stuff that actually helps you get situational awareness as a policymaker or as a community leader into what the heck's going on and what you could actually potentially do about it to improve health and healthcare. Uh, a bunch of announcements got made. I can't possibly highlight them all, but um, just to highlight a couple actually. Um, so you see this picture up here? This is a picture of the Walgreens of the future, uh, which is on a quiet street in Chicago. The CEO of Walgreens came to our June 9th Health Data Palooza to announce that uh, he was going to start spreading this particular feature um, of the Walgreens of the future to Walgreens across the country, the, to major Walgreens, this hub Walgreens. Is. And uh, basically what this is, is it's a, it's a new position of Walgreens called a health guide. A health guide. So um, essentially it's meant to be the Apple Genius Bar, but for health. <laughs> so anyone who walks into a Walgreens can for free consult with this health guide, who's a free health concierge, who can help you find what you need. Uh, and he uses a huge amount of government data to actually do that. So, every, so it's not just file, you know, find the lozenges in aisle four, but also the closest uh, you know, uh, community clinic is here, here are your health insurance options, so on and so forth. And in an act of meta-innovation, as opposed to Walgreens building the IT cockpit for the health guide themselves, they actually issued a challenge on June 9th for entrepreneurs to build for them the best IT cockpit, leveraging government data and other data, to help guide the health guide. Within three months, they got 50 entries that were viable, 25 of which they loved, one of which they picked M Health Coach, which won a $25,000 prize and is now being spread to Walgreens across the country. Uh, University of Michigan announced the launch of the nation's first graduate degree program, master's degree program in consumer health informatics. It's a joint venture of their School of Public Health School of Information, uh, purpose of which is to invent more people uh, who could actually do stuff like what we just talked about. Startup Health is a new combination of a uh, of, a, of a seed investment fund slash entrepreneurship academy slash mentorship network for entrepreneurs. It's seeking to start 100 new health improvement companies a year for the next 10 years, many of which leveraging uh, open health data. Uh, we launched a new health data consortium, uh, which includes California Healthcare Foundation, which we're delighted about, uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Innocentive Health to Ado, Mayo Clinic, National Association of Counties, us, uh, Tim O'Reilly, et cetera. Uh, who are actually taking over the health data initiative going forward, uh, are going to be convening the future health data palooses uh, and additional activities to help promote open data uh, and its use. Uh, New York actually just joined. Nirav Shah, the new commissioner of health there, is a data liberator. He's like a Simone Bolivar of health data liberation. They just actually launched their own health data site uh, and they've put out their first data sets. And just to, just to show kind of the things that can happen, right, when you do this. So they put out this data set that they were sure would be useless to everybody. Um, which was nursing home census by nursing home by week. They said, I don't know how this would actually be useful to anybody, but it's a safe data for us to put out, so let's put it out there. So New York was threatened, I guess, by a hurricane recently. And what happened is the nursing home community mobilized to use that open public data set to plot their whole evacuation plan. So as opposed to calling each other and saying who has capacity, they just used the open data set, which was awesome. <laughs> so, you know, and, 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 and here's kind of an overall punchline, which is that if you think about all those innovations I just talked about, which is just a small subset of what was at the Health Data Palooza, and all 50 innovations at the Health Data Palooza were just a small subset of what's actually happening in the world, right? You know, the best part of it for, from our standpoint is that we did none of it. We did none of it as HHS. All we did was take data that taxpayers already paid for, made it machine readable, and put it out there and publicized it, and then American innovators, in an incredibly short span of time, did the rest. Have I mentioned Joy's Law in this gathering? That was the last gathering, right? So one of our favorite laws in the universe, other than O'Reilly's Law, is something called Joy's Law. Uh, is by Californian Bill Joy, the co-founder of Sun Microsystems, who once famously said, no matter who you are, you have to remember that most of the smart people in the world don't work for you. They work for somebody else, right? And so our thesis is that, look, right, if we want to maximize national social return on our investment in data, don't just have our own smart people work on it. <laughs> Make it available to all the other smart people in the world that care about health and healthcare so they can build stuff with it, products, services, insights, to help improve health and healthcare in ways that we couldn't even imagine and can't possibly do ourselves, but which actually accomplish our mission for us in ways that we can't even imagine, couldn't have even imagined. As the Secretary said, if you look at those you know, 50 innovations, no, no one organization, no 10 organizations could have even dreamed this stuff up let alone have built it and scaled to the point where they're already serving today these services, field by data, tens of millions of Americans in incredible ways. So it's a way for HHS to help accomplish our mission without us having to expend the money and the time and the people, which we don't have, to do all this. And for like a total expenditure, which is like half our coffee budget. Because the data, we already paid for it. It's already there. It's 
already there. We're just trying to jujitsu it out there so that basically it generates a lot more good than if it's just us who, who looks at it. Um, so that's really the punchline, right? We are really catalyzing an ecosystem of innovation that dwarfs what we could possibly do ourselves in terms of the amount of good it creates for society. Uh, and it also creates jobs of the future uh, along the way, which does not suck, as they say, you know? So, uh, so that's really the gist of it, you know? And, uh, you know, one of the things that's really, really exciting to me is that more and more states are getting really interested in this. So not just New York, uh, but Louisiana and others. I was recently actually at a gathering uh, where we uh, talked with Mary Beth, uh, 13 states that are really interested in diving into this. Uh, and a lot of the most exciting data in America that can improve health and health care and well-being is not at HHS. It's with uh, state agencies. Uh, and so we would love to share lessons learned and, uh, you know, help in any way we can. Uh, but, uh, you know, Health Data Initiative is not an HHS initiative. It's an American initiative. Uh, we're just happy to be a data supplier and a cheerleader. Uh, but we encourage everyone who has data that could be helpful to the country uh, to join the fund. Um, and, uh, and spark a lot of goodness uh, that, again, uh, you know, you can't even possibly imagine, possibly imagine. So thanks so much for having me over. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to meet uh, with uh, fellow revolutionaries who are passionate about the power of data to change the world. Uh, and uh, I guess we'll open it up for questions. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Hi, uh, my name is Renee Seidel with the SCAM Foundation, and uh, if you didn't come excited already, uh, I'm, I'm an, I know I'm excited. It's just amazing, Todd. I see him dancing and just exploding full of energy. <laughs> but we have about 10 minutes. At this point, we'll have some more time later to entertain questions, and there are microphones in the room. So, yes, speak loudly, and we have one in the back. Yes, you. Uh, CIO for the California Department of Alcohol and Drug Programs, and I was excited by what you said, and perhaps more importantly, how you said it. And incidentally, we do have a iPhone app that identifies treatment services for Californians, so we too have liberated our data. Um, one of the things that I think is really important in this, in this time is that we start to marry substance abuse data, mental uh, health data, and primary care data. Yes. But there's many confidentiality rules that prevent that from being um, handled effectively. And I think maybe part of this data palooza, we need to get some of the best thinkers, the finest thinkers, to figure out how to do it. Yeah. You know, in a way that still maintains privacy, security, dignity of uh, patient data. Yeah. And I would say that's probably the, the, the biggest issue that I see out there, the biggest barrier to sharing information and really improving health care across the nation. Uh, that's a great point. Um, so, so I might, I might, I might kind of, um, split a uh, thought about that in two categories. Um, one of which is indirectly related to what you said, one of which is more directly related. So, so I would say um, uh, uh, one thing I would encourage you to do is on top of uh, operating your own iPhone app that helps people find services. I would encourage you to take the underlying directory of services and publish that as an Excel spreadsheet or an XML file or whatever it is. Um, and then have that ingested into other services that essentially you can infect with your data uh, to get that many more eyeballs uh, than you have to do. Uh, so one of the reasons to do this actually specifically, uh, one of the reasons why Pam Hyde or Samson is so excited about IPI, is one example and another example of that. Is that not only did she acquire 3.1 million additional eyeballs for zero additional market expense, right? But she loved how the mental health and substance abuse treatment service data, service availability was integrated seamlessly with the rest of the health system. So you guys were crazy, as I'm sure it drives you crazy, right? When people segment like mental health and substance abuse from physical health, you said it's all one person, it's all really related. So the way I triage actually makes the information available to you is in a very seamless way. Right, where it mixes the mental health options and physical health options into one set of offerings that, 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 that creates the feel of, like the substance of a, an integrated system, as opposed to sort of saying, okay, you know, uh, oh, sorry, as opposed to sort of, you know, use this app, you know, if you think you have, you know, any <laughs> mental health options, right? So that's one thing that would be, you know, incredibly costless for you to do, and would just, you know, it's already data you're making public, you know, you've invested in an iPhone app to get it out there, just acquire more eyeballs at no incremental expense, Right, and then go back and report right to your head that you like 20x 
the use of your data, and they'll say, how did you do that, right? Did you buy Google Ads for the iPhone app? You'll say, no. I just published the data and it infected lots of other apps, so I have 20 times as many eyeballs. You know? So that would be one. Um, so the second thing is with respect to patient data. Um, so uh, this is obviously an incredibly important uh, and sensitive issue. Uh, you know, one way to approach this, actually, is, um, and there's a lot of work being done about this, obviously, um, is uh, you know, to, to let patients access their own data, right, and then be able to you know, store that data in a secure place, and there are more and more places actually to be able to do this, so they can actually choose where and when to show it to whom. Uh, you know, there's other stuff actually happening as well to make the, the data more swappable between providers. Uh, you know, but but you know, I'm 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 a big fan, frankly, of just letting patients have their own data <laughs> and allowing them to be their own walking health information exchange, um, and uh, having that be a way to actually integrate the data uh, in a very practical way. Uh, you know, and so uh, and I'm a huge fan of the other stuff as well. You know, directed exchange between providers and affinity networks where you can actually share the data among providers. But but I think sometimes the simplest ideas uh, are the most powerful, uh, and, and letting patients get their own data uh, would be a great a great start. I'm, I'm Kathy Marco from, from Cassite. Sorry? Okay, now I can move. Oh, sorry. Okay. That was the problem. I see. Okay. Kathy Marco from Cassite Health and formerly Health. And, you know, some great examples out there of use of the, the government data, but to really support a consumer's ability to uh, identify high quality providers, you need to be able to provide it with the commercial data. What are your thoughts of how do we how do we move that forward yeah. and be able to get access to information in the, the, the commercial environment to aggregate with what you're you're freeing up? Well, actually, um, uh, what's very interesting about that great question is that um, uh, Section ten three three two that I mentioned earlier, which hopefully now you know about, um, uh, specifically says that we are to release Medicare claims data to qualified entities that can integrate it. Uh, with other data, uh, with Medicaid and commercial data. Uh, that was actually in the statute specifically. Uh, and there are a great many entities that are actually are ready to do that. The thing that they've been missing is the Medicare data. Um, and once they have the Medicare data, then they can really rock and roll. Uh, because I think it's actually in the integration of the data where there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of power. Yes, on this side. Steve Barrow with the California State Rural Health Association. The ACO uh, release of the claims data uh, is real exciting and real frightening. And the frightening is, is that uh, unfortunately not all groups that would form up are interested in helping everybody uniformly across the community. They're helping, they're interested in how they best their bottom line. And how do we protect those folks that are in the same community that they would be functioning from not getting cherry picked out because they have health conditions and right. a lot of claims. So this is a very important point. And, and it turns out that uh, uh, folks who designed the ACO program learned a lot uh, from previous efforts to do something similar. Um, so one, for example, they're not allowing ACOs to lock you into them. You can move wherever you want. B, uh, the global budget that's being assigned is actually risk adjusted. Um, so you don't have an incentive to cherry pick. In fact, actually even an incentive to do the opposite because it's actually with the people who are the sickest uh, that you have the most opportunity to help them uh, and improve outcomes and lower costs. Um, and thirdly, uh, you actually uh, don't qualify for ACO savings unless you can demonstrate performance across a set of quality metrics, uh, which includes actually reduction of disparities. Um, so uh, it's actually, uh, uh, it, 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 it's very, very acutely aware as a program um, of what happened in previous incarnations of so-called global capitation or HMOs, uh, and is designed to, to smart bomb those, those issues. Um, so the way to really do well as an ACO is to do the very hard work of knowing who your patient population is, understanding who needs the most help, helping them uh, before they need a lot more help, uh, and doing the stitch in time, closing the care gap, following up on the, a following up on the abnormal uh, lab result, making sure they're on their blood pressure medication, making sure that docs are on the same page, uh, to keep them out of the hospital, to uh, avoid unnecessary complications, to avoid ER visits that are unnecessary. Um, and thereby improve quality performance, improve health, and lower cost at the same time. Because as Don Berwick says better than anybody, right, better health and lower cost aren't mutually exclusive. They're actually the same thing, if you think about it the right way. Um, and so that, that's really the opportunity that we have with data-armed ACOs uh, to make a real difference uh, that makes the lives of patients better. 
Okay. It's a great question. Maybe one or two more questions. Yes. <coughs> Helen Roth Dowd, my teachers for Healthy Kids. I have a question about the data sharing across institutions. Um, we work with kids in schools trying to take Medicaid, Medi-Cal in the schools, and run it against health, uh, against school records to make sure that these kids are enrolled in lower in Medi-Cal or lower no-cost health insurance programs. But it's very hard to, for institutions. I can understand how you can do this as in, individuals, but how do you get in, in institutions like schools to be able to share with another institution, an enormous one, like health. And that's a problem, you know, FERPA <coughs> is its own rules, which is the federal rules on uh, education sharing, and then we have HIPAA on this side. Yeah. How, what, what is, um, what are you doing, or what is HHS doing to help to share across between those two big sectors? So, um, uh, there, there's an answer that uh, comes to mind and a question that comes to mind. Um, so the answer that comes to mind is that uh, we're actually doing a bunch of work with fellow agencies in the federal government uh, to um, uh, release data jointly um, that's non-personal data. Uh, but, uh, you know, you say USDA is the source of the food desert data. There's all kinds of incredible data that EPA has around, you know, toxic releases and other data that frankly is even more impactful uh, to health than ours is. Um, so a lot of the data that's on healthdata.gov are data sets from other departments besides us. Uh, and that's an important thing. So we're taking a very expansive view of health. It's not just the health care system. It's what determines health, which actually is a whole, <laughs> a whole lot of stuff. Um, in terms of personal data, uh, we haven't really worked on that. Uh, it's a very interesting issue. Um, uh, my, my own kind of initial thought there is that that might be something that uh, is a bigger opportunity at the state level uh, because um, there's more personal data at the state level than at the federal level. Uh, and uh, I mean, there are all kinds of, you know, very important privacy issues to consider there, but, but that, that would be a very interesting topic to explore. Um, and there might be a couple of levels to, to, to think about there. One is how can you take aggregated statistics uh, from the personal data in order to help guide policy? Um, you know, the question of how you can integrate the personal level data um, is, 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 is a whole other conversation and, and one that I'm not an expert in, you know, but um, I could see that there could be benefit there um, for, for the individual beneficiaries, uh, the individual citizens. Um, but I would just recommend proceeding very cautiously on that particular front. Uh, you know, one of the reasons that um, I think we've been able to generate massive good uh, with really minimal to no downside is that we've been extraordinarily respectful of the issue of privacy. Um, and we've been doing nothing that comes even remotely close <laughs> to potentially threatening privacy uh, and moving very conservatively there. Um, uh, so and we can talk a lot more about that. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, but, but one thing I think that, that is kind of unequivocally clear as a good thing to do is letting people have their own data, right? So um, there are actually more agencies across the federal government and states are starting to do blue button, but for other kinds of data. If people are talking about education blue button and energy blue button. <laughs> um, so with the idea being that, look, right, you know, I mean, well, people get incredibly antsy about you sharing their personal data with other folks. They do not get antsy about you sharing it with them. <laughs> In fact, they kind of get actively angry if you don't share it with them. Um, so I think a clear no-brainer and a clear win is to let people get their own data. Uh, uh, and, and, that, and that's a good place to start. Great. Well, we're going to cut it off right now. For now, we have questions later, but Andy is going to introduce our reactor panel. And thanks oh, great. Again, uh, My pleasure. Hi, I'm Andy Krakoff with the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health. And, you know, before I get any further, I want to make sure to to thank two people, or two organizations, I should say. Uh, California Healthcare Foundation, they did such an outstanding job. There were a lot of us that were sponsoring this, no question, but this was really California Healthcare that really spearheaded this. So thank you, Mary Beth. Thank you, thank you. And I want to make sure I thank Karen Shores. Karen, around, is she here? There she is, all the way in the back. So Karen, from the Center for Health Improvement, they're the ones that really sort of made sure that this runs smoothly, and so thank you so much for that. So. Um, I think one of the messages that I, I just, before I introduce the panelists, I just want to say just a few tiny words um, that I, I really sort of took from what, you know, Todd was saying is that if they, the federal government can do it, 
we can too, you know? And the interesting thing that comes to mind for me is that we already have done it, we already are doing it. Uh, at the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health, we're dedicated to, in essence, raising the visibility of children's health issues in California. And we take a very active data stance to do that, really trying to promulgate data out there in the community. And one of the things I think we've learned is that there are already a lot of very, very sensitive data sets that have been successfully released by the state. I think of, for example, the California Healthy Kids Survey. I don't know if folks are familiar with that. But data from the California Department of Education that's released on gang violence, depression, substance abuse, all at a school district level. And these are all student reports. And it's very powerful stuff. And you use that data plus all the other kinds of data that we already have access to. And the power and the potential to educate people, journalists, elected officials, uh, to inform policy planning at a very community level, very local level, um, the, the kinds of advocacy efforts that need to take place statewide that perhaps a lot of you are doing, um, that's the kind of thing that uh, we, already, we already are seeing it. So we want to just sort of we free the data now in the healthcare realm. And just very quickly, the other uh, point that comes to mind for me is that data don't self-organize themselves. I know that sounds like an obvious point, but the work that needs to take place to curate data, to promulgate data, to package data in engaging ways so that people can really digest it and understand it, there's a lot of work that goes into making that happen. Um, and it's, it's so wonderful to hear about all of these, these uh, apps that are out there that are doing just this. Um, and I think we want to commit ourselves, quite honestly. It's, it's part of the process is to say, we as a state really need to release the data, the health data that are out there. But then we as, as, as the people who are responsible for those data and who use those data need to take a very active stance to package it in ways so that we can use it. I mean, Todd is, is absolutely right that the localness, that, that state level data is, is so much, is so useful. And part of the reason I think is, is because we can make data so relevant at a very local level because we have data by city, by school district, where it can really engage with people. So with that, I will now let panelists talk. And maybe, maybe as, I, as I introduce you, you guys don't mind if you can come, come right on up and, uh, and we'll say, I'll, I'll, I'll let them say a few words of introduction. So first, Toby, Toby Ewing. He's a consultant with the Senate Governance and Finance Committee. I feel this is like sort of, you know, like a you know, quiz show or something like that as I'm bringing you up. <laughs> a finance Committee, he's a consultant with the Senate Governance and Finance Committee in the California State Legislature, where he works on government reform efforts. And prior to this position, Toby was the director of the California Research Bureau. And then we have Len Finocchio. Come on up, Len. And Len is the associate director of the California Department of Healthcare Services. And Len was previously a senior program officer at the California Healthcare Foundation, where he specialized in access to health services for underserved populations. And then Barbara, Barbara Needell. Barbara is a research specialist at the Center for Social Services Research at Berkeley. And as principal, principal investigator of the California Child Welfare Performance Indicators Project, Barbara's worked very extensively with statewide county-specific administrative data. And we're going to be asking her a lot about that. And finally, Ron Springer. Ron is, uh, serves as Deputy Director of the Healthcare Information Division for the California State Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development. And for nearly 10 years, Ron has been very active in various aspects of health policy here in, in the state of California at the, state managed medical, at the state's Managed Risk Medical Insurance Board, uh, with Senator Jackie, Senator, State Senator Jackie Speer, and at the Department of Managed Healthcare. So maybe if we don't mind, we can uh, uh, take maybe one minute or two minutes each. If you guys just want to, you know, starting with Toby, um, react to what you heard from, from what Todd said. Well, I, I mean, my reaction is very positive. I, I think that this notion that if the feds can do this, so can we, right? That's absolutely right. Um, in fact, the value of the information that the state of California has, and in many ways the local agencies in California have, is, is much more useful at the individual level than what finds its way up to the federal government. You, you know, I don't know how all those nets are designed, but many of them are designed to gather information from California and pass it up to federal agencies where it gets sorted and cleaned. And, right? and, and so in some ways, we have much more nuanced and detailed data Something that we had talked about before the presentation is, is that are the drivers behind the initiative at the federal level. And it, I thought it was very insightful 
that Todd shared that within the agency there's a recognition that continuing to operate the way that we have operated in this country isn't going to work if we expect to address the health care challenges in the United States. You know, we cannot pay our way out of the health challenges we have. We really have to think differently. I'm not doing something right. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in trouble. All right, I'm trying. <laughs> so I, I don't know that we have come to that realization at the programmatic level in California yet. I, I, I think there are pockets of innovation in, Cal in state government. There are pockets of innovation at the community level. There are a lot of things happening. Some of the innovations that are shown actually originated in, in the nonprofit sector and in the commercial sector in California. Uh, we're a little slow on the uptake, but I think we're getting there. I also would add that, that in addition to recognizing that operating the way we've operated in the past is inadequate, key realization that I don't know we have cons consistently across our program areas, healthcare and beyond healthcare. There's the second realization that the solution out of that needs to actually engage information to inform decisions, right? Quite often we do what we feel is sounds good rather than doing the, the, the tough analytical work to figure out well, what's actually happening the experimentation, the innovation. And, and there's this realization within Todd's agency that, the infor that at harnessing information is a strategy that will help them do better. I, I don't know that we have that cultural belief consistent enough. It's not deep enough in state government yet. There are departments that are doing this, and they're making progress. And, but we're not at this tipping point just yet. And what's happening at the federal government, what's happening with the foundations, I think, are, are tremendously helpful. Let's come back absolutely to that cultural point of here in California. But thanks, Toby. Len? Um, thanks for including me. Um, I want to go to your tipping point uh, mention and where the Department of Healthcare Services is on the cusp of, of a number of different things, which I think are really big opportunities for us to innovate. And some of it's already going on. It's you don't often see how the data move from our providers into our systems, how they're aggregated, cleaned, washed, exported to all of the fact sheets and reports that you see that are done by the foundation and research and elsewhere, which is a tremendous amount of effort, and we're working to improve that all the time. Some of the other opportunities are, of course, the Affordable Care Act. So uh, we are working a lot with the new California Health Benefits Exchange to design an enrollment system that will work to enroll you no matter what your eligibility status is in the appropriate program and as your eligibility status changes you're going to move from the exchange to medical to healthy families to a basic health program if we have it by virtue of a, a statewide client index so we will always know who you are and what program you're in which could be expanded into the private sector if you were to leave uh, affordable coverage programs but this is a big opportunity. We're thinking through in great detail what systems do we already have, how do they talk to the new systems we're going to develop, and how do we use this as an opportunity to make data more readily available. So we're trying to look at this as a really big opportunity. Another one is we are uh, bringing in the Department of Mental Health and ADP programs into the Department of Healthcare Services, which gives us now a new set of data to think about and think holistically about the populations that we serve. Uh, another one, which is a very big one, uh, coming in about a year, is that we have to, excuse all the technical terms, re-procure our vendor who manages all of our data. So all of the data nerds in the department are very excited about how we can use this as an opportunity of requiring of our vendor the kinds of data sets that can be liberated quickly, used for innovation, and that's something we're thinking about a lot right now. And also thinking through how we would have an enterprise information management approach across the departments, across our systems, across state agencies to collectively look at the data that are used across the different agencies so we can liberate them in a way that's coherent, consistent, and address a lot of the privacy issues, which often different programs have very different privacy rules. So we can have a, uh, a collective approach to making sure that they're, they're safe for consumers from a privacy perspective. But we can use them as quickly as possible. We have just launched our statewide, our state level registry, which allows providers and hospitals and groups and clinics to 
sign up for, with their um, electronic health records, which is the first stage. Once they have their electronic health records, the really interesting stuff and the cool stuff at a population health level is the meaningful use of that data to take care of populations. And lastly, we have two uh, demonstrations within which we can do interesting data projects. The first is our duals demonstration, so those people who are dually eligible for Medicaid and Medicare. We have a project that we have just kicked off with the federal government to manage their care better and collaboratively. So big opportunity to use data very cleverly. And last, we have two pilots within our uh, California Children's Services program that are ACOs that will be required to do a very extensive evaluation. So another opportunity to use data in a very uh, collective way. And uh, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks, Len. And Barbara, why don't you tell us from your perspective of managing a lot of the state's child welfare data. Okay, well, um, before I start, I do want to acknowledge, although I am the principal investigator of the California Child Welfare Performance Indicators Project, everything we do at UC Berkeley is in collaboration with the State Department of Social Services. And Debbie Williams, the chief of the Child Welfare Data Analysis Bureau, and her supervisor, Akhtar Khan, are here. So we have representation from the child welfare data folks in the room. And I think that I was asked to be a part of this panel because uh, to some extent we have been able to to conquer some of these demons and do some of this work in the child welfare arena. We have and have had for over 10 years now a quite extensive publicly available, no password, no anything needed, public website for people to go to if they want to look at performance indicators and measures at the state and county level in uh, California. We're very proud of the effort and in the past 15 years, we started off with a yearly publicly available hard copy documents that took a whole year to compile at, at that time and then moved uh, to the web and uh, uh, it's a very much an ongoing process. Excuse me? I brought handouts, uh, one-pagers, that you're welcome to take, okay. So um, it, it, we're constantly honing and refining and adding to the website, but in the process, we've learned a lot about sharing data, about making data public, about the wonderful advantages that we uh, are convinced happen when you share data and make data public, and also about the issues that come up, about the challenges. And those are the things that um, I'm happy to share and that I think we know quite a bit about. We have managed in child welfare. Well, first, let me say I loved Todd's presentation because a, a fellow cheerleader for data, the handout that I brought you, the one pager, it starts with this little quote, data are your friends, <laughs> which is um, our mantra that we, we set about when we started this work in child welfare. And it was quite a challenge to convince social workers that data were their friends. And we often heard in the beginning, you know, I didn't spend all that time in graduate school becoming a social worker to use data. I became a social worker to help people. And we've had a massive change in attitude in California in child welfare where social workers now routinely understand the importance of data and how data is useful to them, how uh, the data that's publicly available can help guide them in their decision-making process. So that is something that can be done. People can, and I think that is a challenge that you have in the health field too, is how do you get, the ner how do you get people to really understand that data are going to be useful to them? I imagine we'll have some time in, in the discussion. I do have some, the issues that come up when you make data public are real. And the whole thing, we, there's been some talk about confidentiality and those, I'm convinced that those issues can be dealt with and you can make data publicly available without compromising confidentiality. But there's a whole nother realm of data issues that have to do with data, what I call data abuse and what happens when there is free and public access to data and people use it, some intentionally and even more unintentionally, in ways that are incorrect 
and how you deal with that in the process of training, the ongoing process of training and educating people once they have data to use it and use it right. That's a good point. I think I want to come back to that one too. Thanks, Barbara. Um, Ron, a minute or so, and what your reactions? So, is this on? Yeah. Um, so I wear two hats. I am the Deputy Director of the Healthcare Information Division at the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development, um, which is it an office that looks at the state's infrastructure around healthcare capacity regarding construction, regarding healthcare workforce, and my division is looking at or is involved with the data collection. I also wear a hat for our California Health and Human Services Agency, which is the umbrella organization of 13 departments like alcohol and drugs and Medi-Cal, mental health, um, and I co-chair a data quality and standards work group that they have recently started as part of their health information exchange efforts, which is another very exciting part of what's going on out there in the world regarding um, the exchange of data. So I'm wearing two hats, and sometimes I'll be speaking from the bigger picture and sometimes from the, the little one. Um, I think that it's, it's interesting that when people say data, they're always meaning different things. And so I think one of the things that struck me with Todd's presentation is when he spoke about privacy protection and made a real clear distinction between the patient level data, which again, for health information exchange and that activity, you, the objective is for care coordination and to be following the person from different levels, different providers versus public reporting. And so um, for every data stream that's out there, um, there's a law or multiple laws that created it for a specific purpose. And so um, while Todd's speaking about this at a very high level, in, at the state level and then at the department level, we get more micro. And so there's a lot of um, um, issues around why the data were, were generated, what the purpose was. Not everything is public, although within my division, we have 13 different kinds of data that we collect. Uh, more than half of that uh, is public. Um, and a lot of it is financial utilization, and you could look at service capacities, you could look at locations of service providers. Um, there's a lot of potential out there, we and we have a lot of tools on our website um, with regards to how to access care, which is a whole other reason to collect it versus the individual level data. And I think that the, when, when one of the sayings I've heard from someone is, you know, the devil is in the details, and the details are made of data. And so the closer you get to the devil, the closer you're, you're, more your head kind of spins when you look at these issues. And so when you deal with these data flows day in and day out like we do um, in my office and like all of these health and human services programs do that collect data, um, they're generally collected for a specific purpose, whether it's public reporting, whether it's providing mental, mental health services or alcohol and drug treatment. And it, it's really important to tease out what the reason is that that data exists to begin with versus what you all are wanting to do with that data. And so I think that's where the kind of the rubber hits the road, which is sometimes there's a conflict between someone's really great intentions, which you know I think a lot of creative ideas are out there, versus really the intent of the law that created the data to begin with and all, all the laws that are out there to protect the privacy of the individuals. It, it, it's a real challenge. So I'm not saying that it can't be overcome. In the time that I've been at OSHPED, we've, we've exceeded our mandates in terms of reporting um, hospital level quality measures and we're producing a lot of really exciting reports and web query tools that we were not mandated to do. And so there's been, I think, with new technology and a lot of creative thought, there's been uh, a bit the beginnings of the realization of the potential of doing a lot more, but I think the, the challenge gets when you get into the, the nuts and bolts of it all. Yeah, and, and let's talk for a second about the nuts and bolts. For a question for Ron and Len. When we talk about what is currently available, um, do we mean that it can be, it's available in a format that can be, to use Todd's words, ingested? You know, that it's, it's available in machine readable format, uh, or is it being available as a PDF, uh, another format that's not really usable by a machine? And I don't know if you two could, could speak a little bit to your knowledge of, of how available the data are. Well, I actually have gone to all 13 departments uh, websites and looked at a lot of the data that's out there on the different health and human services programs websites. A lot of it is in PDF form, static form. And so when I attempted to think, wow, well, if I called them and asked them for a spreadsheet or a Word document, would it be available? I haven't taken that step yet. So I think that it could be done. And I think 
one of the things that I'm excited about is there's been discussions within the Health and Human Services Agency and with the California Healthcare Foundation of a, of a web portal that could centralize data to make it more easily accessible, to look at standard formats that could make it more easily digestible. And so um, I'd be interested in hearing people's thoughts about, about that effort and that idea. Anything? Yeah, that? and I think for us, it depends. So there, yeah. uh, there are various levels of data with richness and complexity and how you might use them. So there certainly are PDFs and to Excel spreadsheets where you can import data into SPSS or SAS or other programs or use it in other ways. There are, you can request data sets that can be put together for you in a customized way, but then it needs to go through privacy review, et cetera, et cetera, and then they'll put together a data set for you. So it's the whole range. It just depends on what you need and how long you can wait. And <laughs> that's the big thing, yeah, I guess. <laughs> Well, so let me ask you this, a question perhaps for all panelists, and maybe Todd, if you have experience too with working with some of the other states. What do we know about the barriers? Is, are the barriers, I mean, we're a state that's not rich with money right now. Are the barriers that this takes a budget, maybe it's a coffee budget, but it's a budget nonetheless to do this. Is it, a, is it the regulations that we think are in there, uh, like for example, HIPAA regulations that we think are preventing us? Is it it's something I think that you were pointing out, Barbara, the fact that there might be a concern, and, and, and I hear this you know, as we travel around the state for kidsdata.org, that there might be a concern about data abuse, you know, that, that the data could be used in the wrong way, or maybe it's all the above. So I don't know, first Todd, if you have experience sort of what you've heard from other states and, and what's prevented them and how they've gotten over that, that may be helpful for us. Well, so, uh, I mean, my, my sample is completely biased because I'm basically only talking to the states that, you know, have put themselves forward as wanting to do this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but, uh, but I mean, they're, they're quite a diverse mix of folks, you know, um, and it's a good cross-section of the country. Um, and, you know, I think that, uh, and, and, and a lot of the issues are actually, uh, I think, kind of similar to what we've grappled with. Um, and, uh, and I would say just maybe a few observations. One is, is that, um, you know, I would start with what's easy to start with and basically go from there. Mm -hmm. Like, so HHS didn't decide to publish all this stuff, like Medicare claims data for physician quality measurement, blue button, you know, community health care system performance level data, utilization service, you know, it didn't, it didn't do that in one fell swoop. Like, well, we started by saying, okay, let's pick the smallest possible set of data that we could actually put out there in machine readable form and have people give us the time of day. Uh, and so we started with community health data. Uh, even that was actually in some quarters controversial. We said, okay, what we really want to do is consolidate all of our public health metrics, terms of health metrics, and produce a whole new set of Medicare metrics that show by hospital for all region, utilization of healthcare services by type, prevalence of disease, uh, uh, quality indicators, prevention indicators. And then we brought together a group of about 40 innovators who are healthcare experts and tech experts and said, look, if we made this data available to you, accessible to you, what could you do with it? Uh, and that was actually the first data Palooza, uh, where nine days later, in front of the secretary and, and, and a whole bunch of people, uh, these innovators produced about 20, 25 really cool new features, application services that took our data and used it in ways that we could not have even possibly dreamed up ourselves. Uh, just unbelievable stuff in an incredibly short span of time. Um, and we invited a bunch of other data owners at, at HHS whose data wasn't liberated yet to the meeting, right? And they said, oh. <laughs> This notion of actually other people taking our data to further our mission, which was very abstract to me before, is now incredibly concrete. Uh, and so from there we started actually expanding what was on, uh, uh, you know, well, then we deployed healthy.gov and we expanded what was on healthy.gov in cycles and cycles and cycles. And we're still not done yet, right? But the point is, as opposed to it being kind of a top-down kind of thing, uh, it was more of a bottoms-up thing. Uh, where more and more data owners across HHS said, oh my gosh, actually, this is a way to get people to work for me for free, uh, to build stuff, leveraging capital and platforms I don't have to enable mental health services to be more accessible, to enable communities to make smarter decisions, to enable you know, doctors to deliver better care. Uh, and so that, that's really how it, how it worked. Uh, and as we did that, people saw that, yeah, actually, the benefit is massive, uh, and the downside is actually a lot smaller than they thought. Um, and, uh, you know, and one interesting phenomenon that we discovered uh, that helps to minimize the downsides is it turns out that nobody wants to look like an idiot. So one of the first things that happened when we published our data was, you know, as opposed to these outside folks who are slinging around like data cowboys and cowgirls, right, they, they want to know exactly what was in this data and what it meant and what it didn't mean because the last thing they wanted to do was be actually attached to an application they were providing that would actively mislead people. <laughs> 
So you know that so that that was actually really interesting, right? That no one likes to look like an idiot. No one no one likes to be the subject of a San Francisco Chronicle story saying, "Wow, those guys were really dumb. <laughs> they produced a product that was really stupid." So so that that was interesting, I thought. Uh, but but the notion of actually starting with what's easy, and then getting gradually into stuff that takes more time to parse was was important. So I think frankly, if all you did was take the data you already have decided to make public, but in PDFs. Well, I promise you, it's producing 1%, not 10%, 1% of the social turn you want. You just turn that into Excel spreadsheets or XML documents, and you put it on a single website, which everyone could find easily, which we could point everyone to, you know, and start with that. Just go with that, and, and, and don't start, you know, getting, don't do the trickier stuff until, you know, later, you know, and build confidence, see what people are doing with it, so on and so forth. The, the one thing I would say, though, as well, is that we found that, that actually publishing the data was about 5% of the work. Uh, like even creating healthdata.gov as a site, uh, you know, and publishing the data was about 5% of the work. <laughs> that 95% of the work was actually promoting the data to people who could use it for good. Um, and so that's why we did all these challenges and codeathons and meetups, et cetera. But the good news is that we and states and others, right, um, have, uh, and these amazing organizations, um, have launched this health data consortium, which is going to be providing essentially a national campaign platform for everyone who wants to liberate data, right? And be promoting challenges and codeathons and meetups and data pollutes and educational webinars um, that you could just easily graft yourselves onto as opposed to doing all the stuff yourself uh, and uh, essentially just ride shotgun on. Um, and so I think that's another great reason why it's a great opportunity uh, right now to do this because you can take advantage of that marketing infrastructure, if you will, without having, a, without having to replicate yourself. I think that's, you know, two, two key points, you know, start with the easy stuff and the data palooza, make it concrete. We're going to be having our own data palooza uh, at the end in about 15 minutes or so. Now, let's talk a little bit, though. Uh, thanks, Todd. Uh, I, I want to hear from some others, too, about what your sense is, knowing the political culture here. Um, and, and the budgetary culture as well, what are some of the challenges and how we might be able to get beyond that to release, to liberate some of these healthcare data? So Toby or any others that you think have perspective well, on this? I, I wanted to add in, con in response to Ron's point about there are privacy rules and limitations and, and you know, head back to what, why the data were collected and established, right? In my experience is most of those rules we make there are some that come from our colleague over here, and he's offered to help us remove some of those barriers, right? But most of those rules we make, and, and many of them we made a long time ago, and we've not actually had this conversation to step back and say, you know, what's possible now with technological advances, with our strategies, how do we actually free the data in ways that are consistent with the policy goals? I think quite often we see that the, the existing policy as a barrier, as an insurmountable barrier. Um, quite often, a lot of those rules are designed to keep this gentleman from talking to that gentleman about shared clientele, right? I, I loved your, your example about the nurse and, and this fabulous innovation, the, the best social networking and information tool is a nurse. Um, a lot of our policies and our practices don't recognize that we also live in families. And they, we create barriers to share information between family members, right? In, in that where one agency is working with mom and another with dad and, and a third or a fourth or a fifth with the children. But there really aren't legal provisions for talking to those people about each other. We, that happens mostly at the county level and, and you know, we, that's very well documented. But we haven't stepped back and said, okay, how do we actually design the rules to make it easier to succeed with information, you know, rather than make it hard to actually get the job done. And so the conversation I think Helen mentioned about schools and healthcare providers can't talk to each other. You know, that's, that's crazy, I think. But we, this is hard to do. It, it, there is a lot of risk. And I, you know, one of the comments that you made, Todd, about rather than asking government to figure that out, figure out who's the audience, what's the utility of the data, what should the platform look like, this strategy of the public sector collecting the information and making it machine readable, and then getting out of the way, take some of that, process, you know, you don't have to spend a lot of time deciding who's your audience. Because you're opening up, as an, that intermediary, you're opening up to the market to say, 
there may be 20 or 30 audiences, and we don't have to pick the one that we think is the most important one. Right? We can allow the market to do that. I think you know, the, the, this concept that there's policies at the state level that could be working against us from talking to each other, I think that's an important point, too. Uh, Barbara, tell us a little, you were mentioning the, um, the concept of uh, data abuse, and, and certainly in the child welfare realm, you know, there's a lot of sensitivities to these data, and I wonder if you can speak a little bit to that in terms of how you've overcome that, um, in terms of making sure that these data can be uh, recognized and used. Uh, sure, if, if you're going to make the data publicly available, I think the first step is, is accepting the fact that it is going to be abused. There is no way to prevent it. It's going to happen to some extent. And the key is enough training and education of the users to be responsible and to understand data abuse when they see it and be prepared to react to it and to respond to it. Um, in the beginning, we did have a lot of fears about what was going to happen when people saw the data. People, there is a natural tendency in a lot of this, once you make a lot of this kind of data public, for people to compare counties, for example, to each other. It, Todd, you mentioned people being able to select hospitals or select doctors, and that is always, that kind of thing can be a real challenge. Uh, I, in my data, I do a presentation, an ongoing presentation about data abuse, and one of my examples is to choose doctor of the year, and you have two doctors, and you're, you choose the metric of the mortality rate to choose the doctor of the year, and one had a mortality rate of two per thousand, and the other of 20 per thousand, and which doctor would you choose? And of course, if you didn't know that one was a heart surgeon and one was a foot doctor, you might be inclined to make the wrong decision. And that's the kind of example that I give to social workers about the kind of, um, I start with something in the healthcare and I'll explain to them, we want a non-threatening example, but those are the kind of issues that people using our data will make, can make all the time. It's inappropriate sometimes to compare counties to one another without taking into account the underlying demographics of the county, the uh, poverty rates, a lot of other things. And that kind of work, that kind of data abuse happens all the time, inappropriate comparisons. I guess the biggest data abuse that I see consistently is the um, inappropriate use of s uh, summary statistics. And especially in environments where we all want uh, a few bullets for information and we'll use statewide, we we'll use a statewide statistic and think it tells us something for the most part. In California, if you have a statewide statistic, the number of children who uh, come into foster, you know, who are reunified within a, who go home to their parents within a year or something to give a child welfare example, a statewide statistic is Los Angeles and then a little bit of other data. And so if you don't have the ability to look at county level data and just use a statewide metric, it can be really, really misleading. We know that we have enormous differences in any outcome we want to look at, not only by county, but by race and by age. So without the ability, which you now have on our public website, to go in and drill down by county, by the intersection of age and race, looking at a summary statistic for the state and thinking that it tells you anything about practice and policy and what you're doing well at and what you're not doing well at and what you need to do to improve is just not correct. I, I like the concept of being open about the fact that there may be some, quote, abuse of the data. And just not to say we have to learn to live with that, but that, that necessarily, if we're open about it before we release the data, we can be in a better position to address it when it comes. And it sounds like that's the strategy that... Yeah, be ready thinking. for it. Get over it. It's going <laughs> to happen and be ready for it. I want to make sure there's enough time for some questions from the audience because now we've broadened the panel a little bit. Um, folks out there? Yeah, right here in the front. Um, I'm Amanda saying yes, I'm the director of the program at the California Family Rights Association. We represent 800 community clinics and customers in California. And um, I, I wanted to raise an issue that Glenn touched on, and he knows that um, I hear about this a lot. It's um, the issue of how do you find the sweet spot between trying to adjudicate everybody's data and make sure everything's perfect and more um, readily accessible 
notion of real-time data. I'm sort of charged with um, this impossible task of creating a statewide patient center health home and statewide data strategy all at one time. And I'm by nature an impatient person. And one of my biggest frustrations, and I'm not a data person, I'm an implementer of crazy strategic ideas. And so I get really frustrated in this environment where, God bless them, you know, it's going to take the state nine months to get me Medi-Cal claims data. So I, I, I guess I'm just sort of asking, I look at the barriers for some of this stuff, and are there ways, and Len and I are going to have a follow-up conversation about this in the next couple of months anyway, but <coughs> so if anybody has any good ideas, or Todd, if you have any thoughts on that, it'd be really helpful to hear. I do. Uh, so for, first of all, God bless what you're doing. Uh, it's, it's an incredibly exciting endeavor. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just, I absolutely, 100%, you know, uh, hear you uh, and absolutely believe that we have got to get more real time with the data. I mean, like Atul Gawan, who is a passionate advocate of the power of data to change the world, right, uh, once said about community health statistics um, that it was like driving down a highway and having your speedometer tell you how fast someone else had driven down this highway three years ago. It was about <laughs> as useful, you know. So, um, and, and, and so, so for example, and so we're making strides in that direction. Um, and, you know, one of the things we're trying to spread the word about is that it's okay if the data is preliminary, right? I mean, we release data like GDP growth and the unemployment rate, right, or, or jobs, right, on a preliminary basis. These are numbers that move entire marketplaces, move entire economies, and we change them significantly. But everyone would much rather that we release the data and update it, uh, label preliminary and release it and then update it, than not tell you what GDP growth was until a year after it had happened. I mean, so, so, we, we, we're, so we're getting into that zone. So one example of this is that um, you know, in our ACO program, right, if a beneficiary says, you know, I'm not going to opt out, um, and I want my ACO to have my data, right? Then we send claims data to the ACO basically on a monthly basis in essentially what is for us real time. <laughs> it's not with a three month lag, it's actually your current claims. Um, and one interesting phenomenon is that the software that's been built um, by uh, a lot of folks to help doctors and hospitals ingest claims data and turn it into real insight uh, has actually become able to account for the fact that the claims that they're getting are so-called initial claims and not final resolution claims. Um, so they actually control for that fact and are able to statistically uh, essentially you know, crunch the data so that it still generates really useful insight. Um, so so I, th I, think we have to, I think we have to, I think we have to move in that direction because if we don't, right, then we really will be, right, in that three-year-old <laughs> <laughs> you know, speedometer data, uh, which isn't very helpful to you as you do what you're doing. I want to give uh, Len a chance, too. And it reminds me, too, of, um, uh, you know, in the, in the children's realm, the child poverty data we get are two or three years old. And in something like what we're going through now, the recession, those data are the equivalent of, you know, driving down the highway right. and, and knowing three years ago. And yet we live in a world when we have financial data that is basically, I could find out right now how a company was doing a minute ago, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but but so there's this you know dichotomy in terms of the data we know about the social and health and well-being of ourselves that's old, and the data that we know about uh, the the health and well-being of our financial institutions. But, I wasn't picking on Len at all. Oh no, that's okay. But I figure if you don't if you if you don't mind, Len. Now for some jujitsu. <laughs> <laughs> so well, real time, of course, in context depends on. Is it a big provider that's sophisticated with sophisticated data systems that can, from the physician visit, the encounter is entered, coded properly, and then moves automatically to us? That could be real time, right, in, in a future world which could be coming soon with meaningful use. If it's on paper, sits for a week, goes to someone else, and then it sits for a month, and then it's entered and sits for another month, and then it's aggregated by the provider overall to send in the claim, sometimes they're lumped together and batched and then they're sent in three months later, then we have very little control over that being real time. So it's moving providers to an automated continuum. So it's real time starting from the visit and the data flows as quickly as possible. So, Anything, Ron, that you might add from your perspective? Or? Okay, uh, other questions? A question right over there. We probably have just a few more minutes for questions, by the way. I work with rural health clinics, both in the state of California and and rural health clinics, you probably know, is a special Medicare certification. 
we're also part of the safety net life community health centers. But because we are not one particular type of entity, very little data is available about us at all. And so I wonder, how do we promote getting more data about what we actually do? Because we really don't know what we do, and without data, we don't have much. Anyone hear that question? Yeah, it's, it, I think it's also a challenge, again, at the physician group practice level or the plan level, the clinic level, about how much data you can convince your practitioners to collect, because it can be challenging. So the more that it's automated, the easier it gets. So we often get pushback from providers that, oh, well, you're requiring too much, or how do you make this as user-friendly and easy as possible? So again, it's a trade-off. So the more you expect that's not automated, the more challenging it is. The more you can automate it through an electronic health record, for example, which is where we're moving, then the more real time and the more we can know about at the individual level, population level, and then provider specific level. Right. 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 Also, if they're licensed by the if the clinics are licensed by the Department of Public Health, they're not. Okay. Okay. I think that's a good point though, broadly speaking, that you know, in terms of the collecting of the data, if we can automate it from the start, then we're, we're going to be in a better position of being able to release it more quickly right. and, and in, a, in a format that's machine readable. Right. Uh, how about one more question? Because I want to make sure we have time for the data. Did you want to say something? Well, well I, mean, so, I mean, so we have a lot of data about rural health clinics. I, I'd be interested in <laughs> understanding. Yeah, I, I would love your ideas about what would be useful for us to put together um, uh, that would be helpful to the cause. That would be great. Uh, one more question, and I should say, too, that you know we're going to break in a minute for the data palooza, mm -hmm. but <laughs> but uh, welcome you to come up and talk with the panelists. You know, if you want more information, more questions, and such, it'd be great to continue the conversation. But uh, right over there. I'm involved with the health and drug testing registry. One of our challenges is to get outcomes at other hospitals other than what the drug testing registry says. So, what are the, do you have any recommendations on how we might get statewide data to make it available to the providers so that they can know when the patient is readmitted? Well, OSHPED has patient level data from all of the hospitals, so you could request a custom data run, but I think you would need patient identifiers, so uh, we, we can talk some more about some options that might be available. Great. Well, I, I want to thank everyone for coming, um, all the sponsors, uh, particularly California Healthcare Foundation, for, for putting this on. Um, I hope one of the goals of doing this is to ensure that we can all sort of see a little easier, I think like Todd was saying, that if you come up with some concrete possibilities, it'll make it all seem a little more real and not as difficult for us to free the data. You know, so please wear your buttons everywhere you go from now on. <laughs> uh, I, there, we have, uh, do we have, I think we have evaluation forms, is that right? They're green, the evaluation forms, please, please fill them out. Um, please join my colleagues in the back, um, various agencies and such from the state, um, so you can get a better grasp of what we're already doing here in California to free the data. Anything else that no, you should? that sounds great. Okay. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Make it a la ocalipo. Oh, oh.